Hello everyone, John Aldridge here with our first ever podcast of Aldo Meets, the new Liverpool podcast with Hotel Anfield. Uh, the sponsors are, and very important this, Liverpool Connect, Taxi and Transfer Service, Bell Lamb and jo- Joinson Solicitors, Kingdom Plumbing, Olympic Scaffold and Tower Eye, Northwest Fencing, and Onyx Estate Agents. A big thank you to all those sponsors. And a big thank you to our main sponsor, Budweiser, for the support, including all the tech required, all the flags and whatever. It's uh, all from Budweiser uh, to make this podcast as good as we, we hope it will be, as well as Dortmund Union Brewery, also available on draft here at Hotel Anfield. I must have a little go with that one. All proceeds go to the amazing charities of Zoe's Place and Owen McVeigh Foundation. And now for the main part. We've got a cracker to kick things off. The one and only, the great Jamie Carragher, who made 737 appearances for Liverpool. There's only the great Ian Callahan, Cali, Peter Pan, that's beat him. And I'm really looking forward to it. He's part of the Liverpool treble winning team, as you know, in 2001. I'm one of the heroes of Istanbul. That amazing night, he was different class. Since hanging his boots up, he's gone on firmly, established himself as a respected pundit on Sky TV and, in, in my opinion, probably the best. Him and Sui was the best. Sui's gone now, so Kat is the best. I can't wait to see him. He's coming in shortly. Hello, everyone. John Aldridge here with our first ever podcast, Aldo Meets, in partnership with the Hotel Anfield. Over the coming year, we'll be uh, having some fantastic guests, uh, both players and persons and people that I know, and we'll have a great time, great some great talks. But the very first one we have is one of my greatest ever players that I've watched playing for Liverpool, defensively wise. I'm not just saying it because he's next to me. I love him as a player, love him as a person. Number one, Jamie Carragher. Thanks for having me on, Aldo. Thank you. Great to see you, Pat. Superb. Looking forward to it. Nice to see you. How's things, mate? Going well, yeah. I mean, the season's uh, started up and running now, isn't it? So, a uh, decent draw, wasn't it, at Chelsea? So, we'll take that and uh, see where we go from there. Yeah. Some talking points. Again, we can't get away from VAR, can we? And I don't want to talk about it because we're going forever. <laughs> you know, but straight away, you, you know, there's a couple of things happening in the game. The handball, the, you know, the Everton goal, you have to say. Yeah. And obviously, the episode at Old Trafford on Monday when I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Mm. It doesn't matter what, whether Wolves deserve the draw or not. For a referee to miss that and a VAR assistant not to ask him to have a little look. Even if he doesn't want to change his mind, just have a look at the incident, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think they were going to make him have a look when it happened. We were doing it, obviously, on the show and I said that after the game. I didn't think they were... Uh, going to get involved here. Yeah, I just felt that as soon as the incident happened and uh, they've been taken off the game, haven't they, the next, yeah. uh, the VAR or the referee, I'm not sure who it has been taken off the off the next game. The Everton one you mentioned was, uh, yeah, should have been a goal. And then was there a couple of contentious ones in, in our game? Yeah, yeah. I'm not a great lover of, of the, the referee who took over. Your I was web. I'm not a great lover because I watched him when I com- was commentating for Radio City many times when Jamie's playing in particular. And he did sort of not have it, but we didn't have it our own way, should I say, when when he refereed our match. But I have to say, I, I, I like the th- some of the things he's doing initially with the extra time, which cost us many mm-hmm. times. When, when, play, when teams come to Anfield in particular, trying to, you know, just loiter and, and get the clock Kill the momentum down, of the game. The and, the yeah. and Newcastle were the ones who got paid the price more than anyone. But he's, he's stopping that and also... The referee who made the blunder and the VAR assistant who was born in Lanc- Lancashire, not in Bersco or, or, or <laughs> Chorley or Liverpool or Lancashire. Why didn't you just put it to put his word his birthplace? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they, they've been sigh and died for the next the next partition of the games, which is the weekend, which fair play to Howard Webb, best thing you've ever done for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just the best thing you've ever done, to be quite honest. <laughs> Carol, it was 10 years this summer since you hung up your boots. Um, the summer just, yeah, 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 summer just gone. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. 10 years. Um, 
How do you, how do you look back now on that that career of yours as a one club man? You must. Is it? Is there any? If you could go back and if you could change anything, what would it be? No, I mean it's nice to look back and you. I'm, I'm sure John's the same. Any players, I think. When you know when you finish your career, you're always proud of you know what you've done, and it doesn't matter what level you get. So I always think you can be proud if you if you get the most out of it. You give it everything. You think you know there's not too many regrets in there, uh, really. I think I got the most out of myself as a player, considering you know the level I ended up playing at. So yeah, I was proud. Of it. It's not something I look back on uh, too much. I'm I'm glad that I've I've got into something with with, with Sky. And it gives me an opportunity to look forward and be involved in things and not be almost painfully thinking about I still wish I was a player. I don't I don't mm. have that feeling. I don't know if you if you're the same, but I don't have that feeling of thinking I, I still wish I was a player. If I see the coach coming in past there, Dan Anfield Road, there's a big European game, you think, oh God, I'd love to have been involved <laughs> in that. You know, but that thing of like training every day and what came with everything of being a player, I loved it, I lived it, proud of it. But I don't sort of think about it too much now and look back too much on it. But it's just realistic. You you know what it is. It is what it is. That's saying I, I I do believe that it is what it is. And you know, I was lucky the fact that like I was I was a player, then I was player manager, then a manager, and then I walked out on the game. So it, it evolved. Sometimes it's hard, if, well it is hard <laughs> to do what Jamie and some people do. Going out of that environment of the dressing room mm. and football is brilliant. The training is brilliant. You feel good what you after training when you win a match. There's nothing better. But you know when that comes to an end and you get up in the, in the following morning and you're thinking, "Well, I can have a full breakfast here." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And thinking, Fucking, you know, or you do something like that. What do we do now? And I'll take the dog for a walk or whatever. You know, you get caught up. You know, people get obviously some mental problems, you know, uh, a, a worse depression, you know, which I, I was depressed, which I didn't even know was about six months later. But, you know, it's great for you that you found something. And, and, and I, when I used to go to Liverpool watching Jamie as, as Radio City, I loved it. I knew I couldn't play no more. I loved it. Back as a teenager, back supporting my club, you know, even though there was a mic in front of me, loved every game, you know, because uh, it's in your blood. Mm. Well, to both of you, really, when when you come to make that decision that you're going to hang up your boots, was there one particular time, one particular moment that made you think, right, one factor that you made you think this is the right time to, to bow out? No, I, I always feel, especially for a local lad, it, it's difficult to leave Liverpool in that, how do you leave? Because it's, for us being local lads, we don't see nothing bigger than Liverpool. So you, you're not going to ever move on for anything better. In some ways, yeah. But you don't want. I, my feeling was I didn't want to be at the club too long, and then the and, and then the supporters are going, looking at the team sheet and going, "Oh, he's playing, he's playing at the back." And I never wanted that. I never wanted the supporters to go to the game thinking, "Oh no, Carr playing." I just I, the, the thought of That's that. Mad, that because I, I was watching when, when you when you hung up your boots. I'm going. I, I'm, I'm, I know, I know you've got another year in you. I know mm. you now. Yeah. But for you to say that, it shocks me. It's very, very, um, very interesting. That, very but, honest. But, yeah, but when I was about 32, 33, I, I, whenever I signed my last contract, I might have been 32 or something, I, I knew two years before I was going to, when I was retiring. Huh? I, I was like, because the thing of playing for Liverpool, you got to remember, from 18 to 35, whatever, 17, 18 it. years, and it's like, it is full on, you feel it more emotionally than other players do. Mm. Everywhere, you can't get away from it. So your family, people you know, everywhere you go, everyone's asking about the result. What's what we'll be buying him and what's going on if it's not going well? And you know what? I just got to a stage where I thought, I'm done with this. I, I need to just have enough of this because I was someone who took defeat and bad performances personally probably too much. I probably put too much pressure on me. So it's probably a little bit different for you because... You, you were here for a couple of years, but the team was unbelievable. You yeah. probably very rarely yeah, ever yeah. lost, but as I had some great times and some really low times as a team. It was very up and down. And yeah, I I, I knew too. I, I, the first time I met Brendan Rodgers, I I told him I was leave, I was leaving at the end of it. I said I've got a year to go, and I'm 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 leaving. I'm done. I'm finished. And I just I always think it's difficult to leave Liverpool uh, as a local player. I think of Stevie Mach. He goes to Real Madrid, but I always feel he's not. 
loved as much as he should be. Yeah. yeah. Because of that reason, because Stevie Mack and Robbie for four or five years under Roy Evans carried the team. Mm. They did do one of the greatest players to play for the group. Uh, yeah. Stephen McMahon yeah. and yeah. then Robbie was probably a bit disappointed how he left and it just I just thought I want to be able to make the decision and go on my own terms yeah with, 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 with Stevie people don't really know what went on behind the scenes by the way mm. you know we won't go on that because Liverpool made a big blunder there and he had every right to do what, what he did and he became become a magnificent player and he's a great bloke but when you left and I'm talking about the next season we, we, had, we were brilliant we lost it. Ridiculous. We won't go into how we lost the league. But do you have any regrets? Because I think you you might have been the difference to get us over the line. I'm not yeah. just saying it because you're there. You know, you know, like even like a James Milner type of you felt you were yeah, it's easy saying, you know, in an hindsight yeah. and all that. But but you it, must think yeah. you must think now bollocks. <laughs> 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 I was in the back of the twelve months. Yeah, yeah. Did, were you sat home thinking that at all? When Suarez is like lighting the place oh, up? Of course, yeah. I'm thinking the one thing I have won my whole career is the league. And the season I leave Liverpool win, you know, win the league for the first time would have been 25 years uh, if Liverpool had won it uh, that season. I mean, listen, when people say I would have made a difference, that makes me feel in some ways like I made the right decision. Right. But because people then go, oh, you were doing okay when you were playing, you could have still played. I never mm. wanted it the other side where it was like, he went on too long, and as I yeah, said, the, you know, the lads are going the game on the coach of the train, going, oh, fucking hell, Tavis playing. You know, mm. and listen, we all think that, don't we? Sometimes when the team sheet comes out, you mightn't say it publicly, but you think to yourself, oh, fucking hell. You know, we, we all look at team sheets, don't we, and think that <laughs> yeah. when Liverpool ones come in. But, <laughs> but the, the, the only one regret, there's only, there's one thing I would love to have done that season. I'd have loved to have played that second half of the Chelsea game. And that's the one game I do look at and think I could have made a difference. And I know that sounds ridiculous because we needed a goal. But I felt the second half of that game, obviously we won nil down, we know what happened. And I've played at Anfield attacking the cock so many times in my life that I just think if I was at the back, just talk, never mind defending, just talking to people. Because what we ended up doing was like having shots from stupid positions. Yeah, like panic. Just, yeah, there was a panic. And I just think my experience then, rather than my football ability, because I wasn't the nowhere near me peak, so I'm not sure I could have made that much difference at 35, but I'd love to have played that second yeah. half. And just just that thing of attacking the cop, keep making passes. That is, I always had that feeling at Anfield. Even if you weren't creating chances, you just keep doing the right things and something just opens up. It just does something. How many times I've played where you just yeah. take and you're behind everyone and say, keep pass, pass, just keep passing, keep moving well. Don't you? And just talk. Because obviously Stevie's had it gone a little bit. I think Suarez has had it gone. You know, everyone just started. Everything seems to just go out the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the one thing I do look at from that season. Just think, that's where I maybe could have made a difference in the second half, just by talking to people. Yeah, Jamie, course. you brought up um, being a local lad, um, how that made you feel. But do you, how do you feel um, the fans judge you as a local lad? And John, to you as well. Do you think that you two in your career have been judged differently by fans because you are local as opposed to any other player? And um, secondly, do, the lo do local players these days, like your Curtis Jones or Trent, do you think they will find it harder to make a... Um, to make the breakthrough like you have, or are things still as possible as they were for you? Well, it was, it's probably more difficult to come through now just because Liverpool yeah. are a better team, you know, than... Well, I mean, I, I say that, my debut, <laughs> Liverpool were top of the league. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the day I scored against Aston Villa was 18, that put Liverpool top of the league, to be fair. But I'd probably say it maybe it's a little bit more difficult because we're one of the best teams in Europe right now under Jurgen Klopp. But it's, it's always a funny one, that in terms of local lads being judged differently, because the local lads will probably say, we get it harder in terms of maybe the crowd might get on your back a little bit more, mm -hmm. maybe how you're looked after wages-wise with the club, maybe be taken for granted a little bit. Mm -hmm. But when you speak to sometimes some of the foreign players, they almost feel that, oh, the local lads might get away with a few things mm -hmm. more. So I think you always look at it from your own uh, point of view, really. Uh, I mean, there's definitely a thing with the club where I think, oh, they know you'll never leave. So I think in terms of contracts, yeah. I always remember this story and uh, I was probably playing as well as I've ever played. So in 2005 and 2007, we get to two Champions League finals and I was voted, not, not my opinion, the fans' opinions, that I was Liverpool's player of the year in both those seasons, you know, when the, the, the fans give their awards out. So I can't be doing any better. 
And then um, we were up for contract talks, about four or five of us. There was me, Stevie, Alonso and Rainer. And uh, I remember Rafa going, hey, we're going to do yours last. I went, why is that? So I'm, I'm, I'm playing the year, by the way. Or, you know, <laughs> we're in the Champions League final. He said, because I know you won't leave. <laughs> I went to, uh, well, I, I know, I won't leave. But I mean, is that fair that like they're actually the one who's seen as the most loyal in your eyes gets his contract left at the end? Mm. Because he was like, well, Stevie could, Alonso go to Madrid, Reina, where are we going to go to keep it like that? Now, it was right what he was saying. But on the flip side, you look yeah. at yourself and you think, that little feeling of, mm. you know, we know you won't leave, so. Kind of wish you never had said it, right? You know, you sort of know they know. No, but they we know all you know. know. We all knew that. Yeah, but yeah, sometimes exactly. I think they play on it a little bit. Being taken for granted a bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, listen, that's not a criticism of the club. It's not a criticism of Rafa. I'm just explaining the story. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Subconsciously, people just know. I don't know what it was like for you. Yeah, but well, that's exactly what I was talking about with Steve McManaman. Exactly that sort of scenario. With me, obviously, they knew I was a massive Liverpool fan because we was well related to in the papers before, when I was coming from Oxford. So when I'm, when I met the, the Kenny Dalgleish, Peter Robinson, John Smith, in a hotel by, by Manchester Airport, uh, and I'm sitting there on my own. I didn't take an agent because this is this is going to happen. I had one agent, had a call at the time called Monster Monster. Did you ever come across him? <laughs> I know great character. He's passed away and he's a great character, Eric. Uh, but I told him he can't have nothing to do with it. So they just come in and they went like that. This uh, this the contract, John, and I went like that. I knew basically what it went. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I signed it because they, they knew that's what I was going to do. And then afterwards, they said, Oh, we've got told you we'll give you uh, £25,000 into your, uh, your pension account. I said, Oh, that's nice, a bit of a bonus. Eh? Thanks very much. I wasn't expecting it. So uh, so that was me because they knew mm. whatever they were going to offer me, I was going to take. And it was only so it was only about like uh, 25% more than what I was on Oxford because I was Oxford's top player. They gave me a real good contract, uh, Robert Maxwell, at, at the time. So, uh, so yeah, but I can see where Jamie's come from. Absolutely, yeah, mm. yeah. I yeah. think I think that's happened in the past a lot of times. Mm. Yeah, Carrie. Obviously, you started off under Roy Evans there, right through Julia, Rafa, Hodgson, Kenny coming back, and then the start of Brendan Rodgers' reign. When you look back on that, what, if you were taking the best bits from each of those manager to make the the perfect manager, what what qualities would you kind of pick out? Uh, well, I, I when you name all those managers. I've got an affinity with all of them, but the, the two of Gerard Hurley and Rafa Benitez, just because that, that was 12 years of my career, and that's mm. where I won my, all my trophies bar one, uh, came under those two managers. So I always feel if you put those two managers together, it would be the absolute, you couldn't get a better manager. So you, 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 Gerard Hurley was great man management, great at sort of organising and running the club, left the coaching to, uh, you know, Sammy Lee, Phil Thompson at the time, he's a great motivator, Gerard Hugo, really brilliant in team meetings and, and fire and up. And then Rafa Benitez coming and he's the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't a motivator. Uh, he wasn't, well, people question his man management. It didn't bother me. As long as the manager picks me. I, 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 <laughs> you can about, manage yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah right. but I understand maybe attacking players, maybe you need their arm around them or yeah. someone needs a confidence boost. I wasn't that type of lad. So... All this stuff when people talk about Rafa's man management, it didn't bother me. As long as my name gets read out, you know, Saturday two o'clock, that, that'll do me. Uh, but Rafa was a brilliant sort of tactician, great on the train and pitch, whereas Gerard Hulier wasn't. So what I would say is Rafa Benitez's football knowledge was a lot greater than Gerard Hulier's. But Gerard Hulier was the type of guy who could bring a club together, bring a set of players, create a team spirit a vision of where we're going. You know, I always had this feeling that Gerard Hulier could manage anything, you know, be the, at the top of a bank, at the top of a hotel, whatever it may oh, be, right. you get everyone, right, everyone's vision's there, we're all, we're all together, creating something, you know, a bond together. He was really good at that. Whereas Rafa was great on the train, but and I always feel if you had the two of them together, it would have been absolutely perfect. Well, he was, he was, he was, um, was it all shop school? Yeah, he was, teacher, was he? Yeah. 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 all shop school, yeah. that's right, yeah. Oh, it is, yeah. But people have this vision of Gerard Hulier of being like this nice uncle. Nice uncle, bit of a disciplinarian, but he was like, if you see him in a team meeting, you'd go, oh, yeah. really aggressive, really on the front foot, like, we're Liverpool, we're, we're playing Man United, you know, really full on. He used to say, uh, you know you know the cup final when, you, when you're a kid watching the FA Cup final and the teams would walk out the tunnel and everyone would be waving, wouldn't they? Maybe the girl friends friends yeah, different yeah. things. The first time we had a cup final, the meeting the night before the game, he said, if I catch anyone waving, 
and your <laughs> girlfriend and me or whatever. <laughs> if I see you shaking hands with anyone in the tunnel, I don't care. I said, you'll see them after the game. I said, you know the fellow who you're playing against, so you're an international teammate. You'll see him in the bar after the game. Do not ever shake hands with anyone at a, before that game. And that, you know, things like that. And you'd be like, <laughs> everyone would be like right, pumped yeah. up and going for it. So I love to, uh, yeah, you're brilliant. How about you, John, out of the legendary managers you play? Oh, Jack, Jack Sharp. Yeah. Oh, cheers, Jack. I loved him and he always let us have our pints. <laughs> <laughs> Zero alcohol, man. No, he was, he was, he was top man. He, I was lucky to have all bit managers in different ways. Like Len Archers, who was, uh, he, he took me to New, Newport from, from South Liverpool. Um, he was old school. Knowing you could do things in them days which you can't do now. You can say things yeah. what you can't say now. When you had it, you had it. Um, uh, Colin Addison came after him. For a, for a bit. Then Jim Smith, he was brilliant. Bald Eagle. Ah, oh, it was great, Jim. His his philosophy on football was like if they score three goals, we score four. <laughs> a little bit like we play at the moment, to be yeah. quite honest. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was suited me because I, I was banging goals in left, right, and centre. And then Liverpool, Kenny got me. Kenny, Kenny, what's, was Kenny a manager? He picked he picked the right when well, he picked the players to, to to form this fantastic team. But he didn't have to say anything. Just go out and beat them. And basically, that's what he... Kenny didn't really do many team talks. In, in fact, just put the team down and, and, and the rest, we, we, we... Well, you know, the team that mm-hmm. we had, you know, Barnes was probably one of the best players in the world, you know. Peter Beasley, amazing. Mm-hmm. Ray Alton, incredible football brain. And, and the, the rest, wow, great, great players. Um, but Jack Charlton, you know, and Johnny King, I should, should mention Johnny King, I have to try and be, you know, God bless his soul. Uh, he, was, he was great to play for, but Jack Charlton, I absolutely adored as a person. What he sees, what you got, you know, and you, you don't cross the line with him. One story, we crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell you this, and it wasn't me. Chippy Brady, one of the best players, well, Ireland's ever had, and Chippy Brady, it was, um, we were always told not to play the ball across the back four the way we play, or across the midfield four, because if it gets cut out in midfield, mm-hmm. Jack said it's like the Red Arrows. Especially them Germans. Anyway, <laughs> he said. So anyway, this was his earlier days. So so play, we're playing Germany. Funny enough, playing Germany, we're one nil up at Lansdowne Road, and, and, and Chippy Brady gets the ball, and he it's his testimonial, full house. He gets the ball and plays it across midfield, gets cut out, bang it's in the back, back of the one nil. Yeah, I know you say that. <laughs> so so anyway, there's three minutes ago before half time in Liam Brady's testimonial. And Jack goes, number seven, Liam Brady off, we all go, fuck me, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't, it's Jack Charlton. So Jack, he comes off, Chippy, the great game ends up one all. And he said to us all afterwards, anyone else does that when I'm in charge, you get the same team and you won't play for me ever again. Because his play, the way we played was balls mm-hmm. into the corner, press into the opposition half and then pressed them, Gaga pressed them. Everyone hated playing against us. When, when, when the from a striker's point of view, when the goalie got the ball and played it out to the sweeper, in them days they played the sweeper, didn't he? Now yeah, back yeah. four. Then teams would back off to the halfway line. He said, "Aldo, chase the ass off him." So I'd be, I'd be doing doggies from him to him to him to him. And next minute you put him on the press, he goes into midfield. We're all over. simplistic, but so brilliant. Mm-hmm. But as a person, I loved him. Yeah, there's a brilliant documentary on him, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, oh, what a, yeah, 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 it was yeah. brilliant. That it was, was, it was, it was highs and lows, and it yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing him at the end, but yeah. and there was the thing was I'm not sure what Will Cooper was when he's all having the sing song back in the old town. Right. Yeah, 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 that was yeah, uh, in Italy with the lady in red. Yeah, yeah, and he's singing it, wasn't he? That was a brilliant yeah. uh, documentary. That C- Carrie, you came up against so many like, elite strikers during that period when Liverpool were competing for the biggest trophies. Do when, when you look back on some of those battles, which are the ones that you look back with most, most fondness and, you know, in terms of the, the ones that were tough, but you just relished the challenge you of taking what? them on. I, I, I love me battles with Drogba. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I saw him, I saw him in the summer and I beat him. We had a good, good chat with him this, uh, in Passion, actually. It was uh, <laughs> it was the Monday night one where it's the old music, Flower Power. Oh, okay. Yeah, me and, me and Drogba <laughs> did a Flower Power in Ibiza. Yeah, but he was... He was a brilliant player, but we had but the, the games against Chelsea were were so good. And and sometimes sometimes a striker can do something brilliant, but it doesn't mean you've had a bad game. It's just sometimes you have yeah. to go, 
Oh, that was brilliant. That, does one remember the one on his the chest turn, that he bodied it in? But we had so many battles because uh, we played Chelsea so often. But every game with Chelsea was either nil nil or one nil either way. So the stakes were so high when you were playing because it was like you knew if you made a mistake, it was probably game over because the only other team had going to concede. So I actually played, would you believe? I played Chelsea 47 times in my career. <laughs> 47. Because we played that, that many must cup be a games. record or some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Was in the but I, times, but yeah. it got to the stage, you know, when you're you're training, even though you don't play against Alan Hansen, you know how to you know how tough it is, you know how to play, or he reads you because you're training against yeah. him every day. Yeah. I got like that with Drogba because you played against him every day. It was almost <laughs> like playing against one of your own teammates because you play right. against him in training every yeah. day. So physically you couldn't cope, but you so you had to always be clever and, and sometimes some, I always say about Drogba, <clears throat> don't wind him up. So it wasn't a case of like, come on, let's go and have a big fight with Drogba. You can't fight him, he's too strong for you. But he was the type of fellow, if you could get on the good side of him, sometimes he wouldn't be Ari. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. But if his head had gone, he was knocking people out and he would yeah. just be a bit like, all right, lad, you're okay, good. Oh, fuck, playing again, aren't we? You know what yeah. I mean? And you'd just be like, getting your tackles, getting your champ, just think, just fucking making sure you keep him on side. <laughs> did, did you play in the game against, was it Marseille when we played that? Yeah. Yeah. When, when I seen them, I thought, we've yeah. got to buy him. Yeah. But we'd already wow. brought Cissé. I was playing, but I didn't play against him. I was playing fullback. I only went centre back the year after uh, when Rafa came in. But we, I think, I don't know if we drew our own one, but we got beat over there, didn't he? Yeah. scored two, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. I remember that game. Yeah. Someone got sent off for us. And, and Jamie we Barron, remind the amount of amazing players you played against, but in training day to day um, in your career, who was better, Torres or Suarez? Mm. Suarez. No. Suarez Simple was a better player. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think they probably had a, a probably probably a similar sort of impact in some ways. Because I mean, sometimes I don't know why you seem to forget Torres a little bit more. Everyone always says Suarez, but sometimes you'll be watching LFC TV and you, you think, oh, yeah. Torres was unbelievable, wasn't he? In those days, two or three years. Technically, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But Suarez as a player and like just training and that. Nice so, Torres was the type of player who he, there was never. I always felt with Torres, there was never a 7 out of 10 performance. It was either 9 out of 10 or it could be a 5. Okay. You know, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the thing with Fernando is, I know you're saying technically, but sometimes in training, he could be like... Shy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what Fernando was, was he was he needed big spaces. So when, in training, everything's basically small, small side of game, oh, okay. possession. And the thing with Fernando is you'd be, you be training before a game and you, you'll see everyone does a little bit of possession before the game. I mean, Steve, you're desperate to win this game, and you think you'd be need Fernando. But sometimes you could always tell in this warm up. <laughs> so be warming up, and he had a couple of bounce off. I mean, Steve, he just thought, we haven't got him to. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. We're going to have to win without him. <laughs> I, can, you know what? I can comply with that because I was the same, you know, in the train. I, I liked space on the park. I know mm. I used to like manipulate space as a striker. Um, very similar to what Haaland does now, the same sort of thing. But in them games, I could get lost, especially yeah. the way Liverpool trip. <laughs> so it's so quick. So yeah, I, can, yeah. I can see where you're coming from there. But for me, I have to say, uh, my my favourite striker is Roger Hunt, you know, obviously, because the first one I've ever mm -hmm. seen, I love Roger Hunt and, and Kevin Keegan well, and, and Bushy, old Robbie and all the lads, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I do think that one season, Suarez, that was ridiculous. He nearly won the league on his own, didn't he? It was really? ridiculous. Yeah. It, was just, it was just as goals, he's got halfway lines, these, the things he was doing, I'm going, this is just insane. For a one season, he was just amazing. I, I always think with Suarez, if, when you talk about the greatest players ever played for Liverpool, I still think you've got to have won something big, you know, like a European mm. Cup or a league. And I do think if, if, Louis, if Liverpool would have won the league that season, say Liverpool could have won a European Cup with Luis Suarez, I think you're talking about him being up there with like Kenny and Stevie, you yeah. know, in terms of like his actual ability was just like, he was the best striker in the world, wasn't he? For that season, yeah, yeah. and maybe the next three or four for Barcelona, he, he was the best out there. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Well, this is Aldo Meets podcast with the one and only Jamie Carragher, James Pearce and Peter from Hotel Anfield. Here we go again for part two.
Tara, during your playing career, I think everyone would always talk about how you were destined for management, you know, a real like student of the game. And uh, 10 years on, it hasn't happened. Why? No, it'll never happen. Uh, the reasons why it didn't happen. I think sliding doors, really, in some ways. I think when, uh, when Kenny lost his job, I'd gone out the team probably a few months before that. And then I would start to do my badges and I'd start to think, well, okay. What I didn't want to do was go into a coaching or a management role without knowing anything about it and thinking, oh, I've made a mistake here. So I asked Kenny because I shadow him and Steve Clark. When I say, you know, just going to the team meetings, you know, how do you organise a training session? What do you speak about? You know, how does this work? So I'm not playing as much. I get that. I was never going to cause anyone a problem with that. But to keep me stimulated, I'm almost getting into this side of it. So... That was agreed. Not like I'm on the coaching staff, but did mm. they give me a little bit of insight into yes. how it works? Brendan Rogers, obviously Kenny got sacked. Brendan Rogers came in. I was in Dubai when it got announced. Brendan Rogers phoned me. We were on the phone for about an hour talking about football. I'd never spoken to him before, but his ideas, you know, my situation, the team, my thoughts on the game. And at the end of the conversation, he said, I want you to be a coach. I want you to be a player coach. And I said, well, you know what? I'd spoke to Kenny about like, not a similar role, but, you know, shadowing him and Steve Clark. I said, I'd love to. I said, because, and I said to Brendan on the phone, I said, listen, because he was a young manager, Brendan, don't forget when he came in, I think he was, what, what was Brendan, about 38? 39, 38. He was probably about three or four yeah. years older than me. And I didn't want him coming in thinking, oh, he's going to be a problem. You know, because I knew I wasn't playing. I said, listen, I know Agar and Scale are your first choice now. They're better than me. The younger than me, you've got to go with them. I get it. I said, I'm your, your, your Europa League man and your Carlin Cup man. So don't think for one minute you're going to have me knocking on your door or I'm going to be causing you a problem. Because I didn't want a young manager coming in and thinking at the back of his mind, oh, he's a problem or he's, he's after me job or something, all this nonsense. So I, I sort of said to Brendan, I'm leaving. This is my role. Coach, brilliant. Okay, that, that'll do me. And then it, when I met him face to face, it was in the, in the Hilton in the centre, once I got back from holiday. And he said he changed his mind and he wanted Mike Marsh to come from the academy. And I went, listen, fine, you, you know, obviously your decision, but I'm leaving at the end of the season. So I got six months through that season and I wasn't playing. I never got back into the team until after January, but I'd already agreed to join Sky mm. in the Christmas. So I'm not the type of fellow who would go knocking on the club's door, asking for a job or nothing like that. But they knew I was leaving and there was not on there. And again, that's not a criticism of yeah. anyone. That's just like... I, I had to look after myself. But also, I did look at Ulier and Benitez at the end, the two managers who, who I loved, had great respect for. And I just saw them at the end of the job, and I was like... So you had that. I had the fact that I'd never moved. And my kids were in school, and I was thinking... I just looked at it, and I just thought... And, and another thing as well, and I still think about this now, the four top managers when I was at my peak were sort of like Wenger, Rafa... Fergus and Mourinho, none of them would play their high level. Mm. And I always have this feeling that they're obviously not great players, but they've got a great mind for the game. And they've just got this burning desire to show everyone they've got a great mind for the game. Whereas when you've been a player, you've always feel like that's your career and your management's almost like your, your second career, even though it's still important. Yeah. And I just look at it and think, am I going to be putting as much work in as them? Not that I'm lazy, but they're like, their life is like a coaching session going to one. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be competing with people who I'm not as committed as. So I'm not going to come out on top. You would, you know. I don't know. I you just... would because I know you as a person. Like <laughs> when, when when I was when I went into the management side of things with Tramia, it took over my life. You know? so, yeah. That's the only thing I want you to do. You know, you do neglect your family, your wife, to a mm. certain degree. You put everything, 24 hours, you hardly sleep, you've got a little notepad. Okay, no pad next year. Yeah, and you wake up and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Like, you know, like for instance, like we had this long throw, Dave Chalner, the long throw, and um, we couldn't score from it. It's a ridiculously long throw, as you know. And I'm in bed, I'm going, I can't sleep. Why can't we score from this long? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I'm going. And all of a sudden, I went, cricket. I love cricket. <laughs> I'm thinking, when the ball comes in, the field comes in, I'm thinking, so I thought about it, I thought, <laughs> right. So we're playing, I forget who we're playing on the Saturday. Yeah. So on, on the Friday, you do your little set plays and all. I said, right, Dave, throw throw, throw a couple in. And, and we're all under it. I said, right, all use midfield players, 20 yards back. But I said, just go 20 yards back. And when he goes in, you move in with the ball. 
Next minute, they're going to the top corner, they're going everywhere. It was something simplistic as that, because we were getting caught underneath the ball as it was yeah, coming out. Yeah. You know, but that's what I'm saying. Your mind's going all the time. And, and you do, you neglect everything. I looked after Sammy Rovers, the players, everyone that I do, unbelievably more so than they did my family. So it does. And, and maybe you took the right decision, pal. Because you, know, you would have worn yeah, yourself out. I, I think I would have. But I, I think about football constantly. Uh, not just like the match, but I'm already thinking, right, Monday night football, what am I going to do? What could I, what, what's that team doing? What? So the, I still almost, I think as a player, I almost thought like a manager. And that's why I say at times I've had to put too much pressure on myself. I've been really hard on myself if I've made a mistake or we lost the game. But even now, what this job gives me is that I feel like I'm totally immersed in football, but I don't have that roller coaster of like yeah. the great results, mm. the bad results. Yeah. And the high is never as high as the low is low, mm. I would say, when I was playing. And that's the thing that I sort of like, that I still wake up in the morning after Liverpool have got beaten. You still have that feeling, you still think, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah. But then I always think, imagine what Klopp's feeling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I do think of that. You're spot on. Yeah. yeah so, uh, but no, I think it's been right for me. I mean, haven't had to move around, moving the kids. I look at Steve, look, look at sort of Stevie and Rooney, two local lads. Had a good go at management, probably still a long time to go, but Stevie's already been to Glasgow. Birmingham's not too far away. He's now he's in Saudi Arabia. Rooney's been to Derby. He's been to America. Now, it just, it, it can't be, just because of who they are and maybe the money they've got and the fame that they've got, they're still, we're all still normal people. We're all going to still do the same things. How does that affect the kids? How does that affect the yeah. wife? Travelling, seeing each other. Stevie's kids just started playing football. You know, just little things. Mm. They're still humans. They've still got these things that Absolutely. we've all got. And I just think here, uh, for me, no, moving away from the family wouldn't work for me. And I mean, the players these days, they are seemingly being told, look, it's a short career. You've got to like be professional and work really hard and uh, also make your money. But then obviously, if you then go into management and this routine of away travel and everything, all that stress that comes with it, it just never stops. And you end up like Carlo Ancelotti in his... 70s, I think, by now, right? Roy Hodgson. Uh, um, Roy Hodgson, yeah. yeah. Roy I mean, yeah. 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 at what stage would you take that step back? When do you spend the time with the family, spend that money and enjoy your life a little people bit as well? Different, and I'm not insinuating that you are bored, John, or that you are bored <laughs> yeah. to be sure you're busy guys, but that's that's something that you've been working really hard towards, right? To have a bit of a balance. I think I'm actually, this might sound silly, I think I'm actually busier now than when I was a footballer in terms of, uh, going away or travel because if you're playing for Liverpool, half the games are at home, the other half are away, obviously. So, but with the, the stuff that I do, if I'm away with Sky or I do the Champions League, I could be away. So, to leave Monday morning, get back Thursday, that, that, that's not every week, but that could be probably 15 to 20 weeks yeah. of, of the year. Mm -hmm. The big thing that's the big, uh, that helps me is your summer's so much longer. There's no pre season. Yeah. So, I have, so from the day the last game is, mm -hmm. To the day of the, the first game, you took only three months. Yeah. So that's there's no sort of real work in that. So I can get a good, but as soon as I'm back, it's it's full on. You're into it, yeah. Yeah. So you do get your breathe, don't you? That's that's the only oh, yeah, thing. Yeah. You get your breathe. That's that's the main thing. Yeah. So I, I, even I, I, though, I, so yeah. even though when you when you're doing your, your sky, you can still have like three days. You want to go to Ibiza? Oh yeah, yeah. But well, when the Champions League so, kicks in and, and yeah. stuff like that, but yeah, you can still get, you still yeah. enjoy the the, the the traveling part of it. Is that because I always found the travelling part hard to do anything. So I want you there and you're doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the travelling part's a bit of work. Well, I go to London, I go on and say, you know what? It sounds terrible. I, I, I love the train, but I don't mind the peace. You know, just like, just on your own, on the train. Not wasting, <laughs> no, get on no. the train. No, mate. And someone gets on you know, you're like, oh, for fuck's <laughs> sake, give me a plow. And you fuck up, sit right yeah, next yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you never see me, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you, get, you, get, you get all your little yeah. notes down what you've got to do. you got your phone there. You get all the shit out of the way, don't you? Yeah. And then, bit of you know it, gear, bit of sweat, <laughs> sweet, bit of gear. Before you know it, you're at Houston. Yeah. Right, yeah. Don't you? So how, how did the job at Sky come about? Well, when I said I was I was doing my coaching badges, what I, two years ago, I wanted, it was either going to be TV or going to be coaching, and I wanted to dip me, me, uh, me toe into both. So I did the Euros in 2012 at Roy Keane, Roberto Martinez and Gareth Southgate, actually, for ITV. I was still a player, Liverpool, and I really enjoyed it. And I can't say I love doing my coaching badges, I'm being totally honest. I was going up to the academy, it was Conor Cody's group, John Flanagan, so he obviously got to know all of them, he did great. And... Uh, I enjoyed it, 
I mean, I'm the type. You're the same. I could talk about football all day, yeah. being in a pub, debating, arguing. We're used and to that's carrying on. Yeah, that's all we've ever done. On this, it. You grew up on music and football, yeah. and cricket, but it's whatever yeah. sport. But you're right. I do. I do love the debate of anyone or with anyone, and, and not, there's no right or wrong. Mm. Putting your argument forward for reasons why a team should play or win. So, I think it, it suits me perfectly. What I do. Yeah, and what about that dynamic between you and Gary Neville? Because of course. I think it makes for compulsive viewing on Monday Night Football. But that did you? Because obviously during your playing career, you were like arch enemies for so long. Did it? Did it just click when you started working together? Yeah, I, I don't know about you, John, but when when, when I finished playing and you, and you start talking to players who finish playing from rival clubs, it's almost like these barriers come down. Yeah, the doors open, yeah. and everyone's just like you're swapping stories and anecdotes. Mm. And I, I just when I was playing, you go to England. You, no one had asked someone, what, what's Benitez like in training? What sessions you, or what's Ferguson like? You don't like, no, I'm not telling anyone about that. <laughs> and, it was, and it was all the same. And I just feel, once you'd stop playing, that thing went away. And in some ways, it was probably a little bit silly. And it probably did hinder us a little bit for England. That it was almost this like, we were so entrenched with the club. I think the problem was, that might be a little bit different now. I might be wrong trying to work it out. But the four big, biggest clubs... For a spell with sort of us, Chelsea, Man United and Arsenal. Yeah. And certainly for us, Man United and Chelsea, the biggest players or the, the, the biggest sort of characters were English. It was like mm. me and Stevie, John yeah. Terry and Frank, the class of 92. So we weren't just in the England squad playing for those teams. We were almost like the the, the, the face of those teams. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, whereas now I'd be like Van Dijk and Salah for us. But it was almost felt like it was me and Stevie, like sort of on the front <laughs> foot, and so but there was always England had the problem. That. England had the problem for that for years, you know, clannishness in, in the dressing rooms. It, yeah. yeah, it clicks segregated. Yeah. I knew that from when, like, when my people Barnes and Peter and Macker was there, and obviously with with Ireland, it was completely and utterly yeah, different. Yeah. We were just one happy family. That's what I think. One thing with England that's kept England away from winning things because they've always had the players without shadow, but they've had the managers and such. That's one thing, the togetherness as a unit, as a squad, not just the team, to take them forward and maybe go and win, win things like Jamie. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, but but yeah, we had that. I can see where Jamie's come from 100% on that one. Yeah. So how, how much work goes into preparing yourself for something like Monday Night Football? Uh, a lot. A lot goes in. We're in group chats. I'd be, I'd be sending maybe something into that group chat today so we pay for example is yeah I, I won't show you the exact message but, <laughs> uh, so we did monday night football last monday now and uh i'll find the group chat and the, the morning after so uh so the, the show I, I got back to the room at say 12 o'clock so the show finishes at 11 you get in the car called past 11 get back to the hotel room and then what time did i send this in i couldn't stop thinking about the show because we had a new studio so we're really passionate about it. And so basically 12 hours later, at midday the next day, I put a big sort of message to the group, what we need to do better. Yeah. You know, almost like, right, that needs to change. We need to do that. Not not me almost telling them what to do, almost mm. like as a team, mm. I could have done this better. We need to do this better. Because it was a new studio, it was the first time, right? It went down well, but what can we do for next Monday? <clears throat> so I'm constantly thinking, yeah. you know, all like the different ideas that we, we could have had or, or done slightly different. That's why you've been a great manager. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't I know it's not going to happen, no. but, but that, that's brilliant. That, that's the passion. Yeah. And that, why you were so good at football. Why you wanted it so much. Because that's what you've got to do. That's yeah. what you have to do in life. You never do anything 100% right. There's always little yeah. flaws here there. And to be honest, it's great it's, to know that. It's, it was funny. It's been eating away at me a little bit uh, the last couple of days, thinking, did I get that right? You know, when I was doing that, and I, did I get that right? And it's and, and a lot of it, not, not you know, so I've done it for so long now, it's not like it, but it was almost because a few things were new and a few things were different, and I had an iPad in my hands and getting it on the screen and getting it working. And, I, and I, I've had that feeling the last couple of days that I used to have if, if a game hadn't gone well for Liverpool. Mm. Whereas, like, you're almost, you need to get to the next game as quick as you can to almost get it out your head. It's almost mm. like, I want Monday to be here. <laughs> so I think we can do it again, you know. And yeah. do you know that? I don't yeah, know. I was, yeah. I was like that no, as a player. Yeah, 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 I need yeah. to get that feeling out of me. But that's always like I've, I've got a big drive. It's like whatever I'm doing, I need to be like I, I'd never be able it's to just not, switch. It's, off. Like, it's like if you're not scoring a goal, whenever you know. You, I was you, all right with that. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah. <laughs> it is. You, you know, you got to get one in, and yeah, all of a sudden yeah. the world's a different place. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. But that does lead me to the question about like social media and like criticism levied at you occasionally, obviously, very rarely. But uh, do you actually it, read it? it? I, do you, I mean, you're clearly an outspoken guy. You say what yeah. comes into your head and that sometimes comes with a drawback that people disagree or think it's wrong what mm. you say. You know, yeah. obviously, John is now on social media as well, right? Yeah, he finally caught on with that one. Do you do you see what uh, what what gets said? Do no. you actually read you, it you and listen, you, bother you, you, to reflect on no, it? No, no. I mean, to be honest, I, I think social media, some people like it, some people don't. I like it because I think it's a really powerful tool. Mm -hmm. But you've got to use it, not let it use you. Yeah. Yeah. And get in this, this weird of seeing what people are saying. It doesn't matter what people are saying. And to be honest, I, I use it as a little bit of a joke, a little bit of a laugh. Yeah. Mm. You might say something serious. Now an you take thing, a piss yeah. out of yourself. Yeah. And it's like... I mean, no, it, I can assure you, it doesn't affect it doesn't affect me one bit. And you know, people get so wound up by things, but I don't, <laughs> half the time I'm I use it as like a bit of a laugh, bit of a joke. Use it to promote yeah. the show that you're on or whatever it may be, and try and use it to help you, not let it hinder you. Because I think at times people can get a little bit bogged down it and it can affect them. I mean, to be fair, I when people reply to you, none of that comes to my. I don't have that on my phone. Yeah. I only have it where. People from the, I can see what people if I first so want to see if John replies or James or yeah. journalists or Liverpool or something like that. It wouldn't be any Tom Dick or Harry. No, I, <laughs> I, I and the ones that the ones that come with shit houses anyway. Yeah, they, they, don't, <laughs> yeah, they don't put the name to. They, we all know what the score is. It's just if they put just, the name to, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. I'll have to tell you. Put the address. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I did once. I went to a game. Um, it was it was a uh, Liverpool youth against Manchester United youth. Um, some years ago, and they were Liverpool win 2 0, they got beat 3 2. Uh, but there was a section of, of, of Man United fans who were singing, you know, the songs that we, we, we talk about, like, you know, and so I was only obviously it was a small man, obviously, and I was livid. We stomach was cheering, and I thought, because there was about, what, 6,000, whatever, and I was absolutely sick, felt sick. So I went on my social media and I said, right, there you go, and then the door coming back at me from all areas, I said, right. I will be in the Cobden Arms this night. And I tell you what, if anyone wants to come up from me, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting there. I'm saying, right, I'm having a pint. I'm thinking, I hope, I hope no big bastard. You know what a man you like to scout? A temple photo. <laughs> now, obviously no one came. No one came. But, but that, that's that's what you're waiting with. That's yeah. what you've, you've got. Haven't you? I mean, it's, it's, hard. it's a really, because it... it People sort of sometimes maybe dismiss social media, but it, it is important. It plays a big part in most people's lives. Yeah. People, you know, look at it. People, you know, it, I think it's a really good thing. There's a lot of good people out there who, you know, even now when I look at football analysis, I look at some of the things people are putting on there about Liverpool and different clubs and, you know, bringing people together. And of course there's idiots, but there's idiots yeah. everywhere. Yeah, 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 and you just can't let the minority outweigh, Absolutely. obviously, the majority. So I, I quite enjoy But Liverpool is... I've supported us all over the world. We all have our opinion and they're all slightly different. I just don't like the fact that someone gets so wound up about something because if you've got a different opinion. Yeah. It's like, we don't need to fall out over it. It's just mm. like, that's how I see it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You see so it differently, you, you know, so that that's that's all. It's and and I guess in your job as well, especially in the early years, you're having to critique people that you played with, mm. people you played against, and some people don't. Was, was that difficult at all to start with or were you just dead set on... I've just got to be honest. No, I mean, the only probably one would, would have been Stevie, really. Uh, and then Stevie went and stamped on someone for uh, against Man United. And I'm in the box yeah. thinking, oh, fuck, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was about it. Maybe John, I mean, I didn't really have a relationship with, with yeah. the, I mean, a little bit when I'd left. But I mean, Jordan Henderson, I played through. You think about the team now, Jordan's left. Stevie was there for that, I think, for a year or so. But that was the only one. And listen, we've all got people who we're close with who you know you would treat slightly different to someone else. And, and we all get, you know, Gary was accused of that with Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer. But we all understand it. We've all, we've all been in that position where it's someone you're close to. Yeah. I think our answer had it with Kenny when he was manager and things mm. like that. It, of course, that's just human nature, isn't it? You've got to look after your mates or someone. But I would say it would only probably be being Stevie, yeah. if I'm being totally honest. Because it, it, also in my head, I think I'm I'm on Sky or whatever, John's on whatever he's doing. It's like, I need to make sure I'm doing my job. I play for them now, in, in some ways. That's the way I looked yeah, at yeah. it. It's like, I've got to do my job right. I've got to get this right. And I don't want to say something. People will say, accuse me of being biased uh, to Liverpool. But 
If I say something about Liverpool and the same situation happens the week after with Man City or Man United and I say something different, it actually makes me look stupid. Yeah. So if I end up giving a view on something that's not what I believe, that'll come up again. And I then we'll say what I believe. And you know what Twitter's like or anything. Yeah, but you said that about that. You said that. So then you've always got to try and stay consistent <laughs> yeah. as much as you can. And thank God, Steve, you left. <laughs> <It's right. laughs> Do you know what? I get that spot on, but I can be so biased. <laughs> I, I, I stamp in shit loads of times you know, like, on side and with Liverpool. But this is all Dog Meets podcast with Peter from the Anfield Hotel, James Pearce, and, and, and the great Jamie Carragher. All right, Jay, let's talk about the 23 Farm Foundation, yeah. which you've got, and, and also whatever charities you do. You do lots in the city, which which uh, I keep tabs on. Uh, everyone's grateful for, you know, we all do our little bit, whatever we can. You've done a great job, pal. Yeah, uh, listen, I think we're in a privileged position, you know, yeah. certainly myself with the, uh, the financial situation of being a Premier League player, obviously 10 years ago, uh, the job I've got now. I had a testimonial being at Liverpool, put the money to charity. So, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the 23 Foundation. It's not just me. There's a big team yeah, yeah. of people there who work. My dad's mm-hmm. involved. Mike Leppard plays a huge role. And a guy who's a massive Liverpool supporter from uh, up in, uh, in Yorkshire. Uh, but we predominantly, I wanted to keep the charity in, in Liverpool to help Absolutely. Liverpool charities and, and our people and, and that. And... Uh, you have an idea of what a charity would be at the start and then it just grows arms and legs and you, you meet different people and, and different things happen. So, yeah, it's been going now. I mean, I think that must have been 2009, so it might have been almost... Is it that long now? Oh, no. I, I did a 20-year anniversary, didn't I? That was only a year wow. or two ago, so... Oh, was it a 10-year anniversary? Am I getting carried away? <laughs> <laughs> You're not that old, mate. No, 10. it would have been 10. Yeah, yeah, it would have been 10, uh, 10 years, so... That was really nice. We raised a lot of money. So at first, we, it's it, it's strange because you end up actually giving money to other charities, really. So you, And what I do, I, we don't uh, give huge amounts away. I'd rather give sort of a few grand even there to lots yes, of people. So it might be like yeah. keep the youth club going yeah. for the six-week holidays. Uh, someone needs uh, football lessons or, or, or equipment yeah. to get into sport or travel to represent someone and, and stuff like that. We done uh, we started putting football in schools. Uh, yeah. Joe Anderson helped us with that uh, through the council. And the thing we're into at the moment is defibrillators. Yeah. So we've, we've got a real thing behind that. So we've actually donated, I think we're up to nearly 20 defibrillators now around the city to mm-hmm. normally sporting complexes to make sure that they've got them. Uh, and that's part of the Oliver King Foundation, I should yeah, mention. Yeah. So I got on board with him and We've got legislation change for uh, defibrillators put in all schools now around the country. So what we've been doing is just trying to put them around the city. So we give a few quid to where all day when that hospital was going. So yeah, we've we've done a great work. It's and it will carry on forever now. It'll, it'll always be there uh, and keep trying to help it. No, I love that. You no, know, anyone. I, I, obviously, we we had, as as like. The X players, you know, forever Reds, we 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 do similar things. And, and it's so important when you come out of football, you know, I do it in, in Portugal with me golf day there or whatever. But, oh, you said still used to do yeah, so still that going on, mate, yeah. yeah. But just, you know, and you used to give me stuff, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 So is that still going? It's, it's next month, actually, in a few weeks' time. But it's just, you're just honoured and, and, you know, you're humbled that we were lucky to do what we, we did. And, and there's so much shite in this world. We, You know, if you can help anyone, you know, some way of form, you know, it's just great to be able to do so, pal, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's two things, I think, being from the city. I think the first one is that if you become a someone or a fame, whatever word you want to put on that, uh, I think it's always very important in the city not That's to forget where you come from. So that'll easily get thrown back at you and rightly so. I think we, we, we realise that we're in a city where, you know, at times we get a lot of flack, a lot of things thrown at us, we've all got to stick together at times. So if, you, if, if you're if you seen as the guy who's made it and then you're almost leaving 
where you've come from behind. And that's obviously a big no-no. But the fact, again, that, you know, you'll say, oh, this charity is great and what John's doing in, in Portugal. We couldn't probably do it if we hadn't become who we'd become. So yeah. I, think, I, think it's, I think it's important when you get that profile or that platform that you've, you've, you're in a position there where you, you can do things that other people can't and you've got to make sure that you do it, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a question for you now. Right. You've got to name a team from the 16 years you played Liverpool out from, from goalkeeper, whatever formation oh, okay. you Who would it be? Rainer would be in goal. Okay. Uh, I think John Henry should be left back. I'm going to go Steve Finnan at right you, back, yeah. just over Babbles. Babbles only a year, even though he was great. Sammy Appiah definitely centre back. Yeah. You've got to get him there, obviously. No, I wouldn't pick myself <laughs> in. No, I'll pick the uh, team I played him. You know what? I'm going to go with Encho. I think that yeah. partnership got Liverpool right back under Rulli. I mean, it could be Daniel Aguet. You know, I love Daniel. I had a yeah. great partnership with the times you're in, but obviously he had a little tough time with injuries. I'm going to go with Stefan Encho. Mm -hmm. uh, Right, Alonso's got to be in there. Yeah. Stevie. Yeah, but I'm just thinking, what for me? Stevie maybe go? Yeah, Stevie'd obviously have to be in midfield mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Uh, I'm going to have to put Didi a man in there. Okay. Well, as a old midfield player, yeah? Yeah, so you, Stevie could be a little bit yeah. more to the right, yeah, yeah, tucked yeah. in a little bit. I played a half of football on my second ever game for Liverpool with John Barnes. Oh, <laughs> the counts. Yeah. So John Barnes has left to wing. go left wing. No Mascherano. Well, listen, I decided to go for a pint with Didi. <laughs> 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 uh, Suarez has to play up front yeah. and it would have to be with... I'd have to go Fernando Torres. Yeah. I didn't play team. with Robbie when Robbie was Robbie basically for Roy Evans yeah. in, the, in the nicest possible yeah. sense. So it's not a bad team, team, that mate. It's not a bad team at all, that is it? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Carol, before we let you go, we've got a quick quiz. Oh, go on. Uh, I like quizzes. Be fair, the, the, the quiz is six questions. Okay. I know that's quick. It's a quick six questions. Try saying that. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this is simply because Liverpool Football Club have won the European Cup. Six times. <laughs> not once, not twice, not three times, but six times. <laughs> so six questions. All the best, mate. Right then, let's kick things off. Number Go one, on. you made your debut for Liverpool off the bench against Middlesbrough in the days when teams could only name three substitutes. Yeah. Can you name the other two alongside you on the bench that day? Oh, God. Was one of them a goalie? Yep. Would that have been a... So what year is this? Nineteen ninety-seven. January ninety-seven. Is that Sten's guard or someone? No. Was he? Uh, is he the fellow with the nose? <laughs> uh, <laughs> local, local lad. Oh, Tony Warner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I remember. <laughs> was Michael Owen on the bench? No. David Thompson. No. You're getting closer. Uh, well, I. I and you remember who I came on who I came on for? He was Irish. Mark Kennedy. Yes. I came on for Rob Jones and then Jason McTeer at right wing back and I come on centre midfield. Yeah, go on. Number two, you scored your first Liverpool goal against Villa yeah. in a 3 0 win on your first start. Stan Collymore got the second. Who got the third? It's Robbie Fowler. Correct. Number three, which Liverpool player made his debut for the club that same day? It Cavame. Correct. Which former Liverpool player uttered these words? Carragher is 10 times a better defender than I could ever be. Ooh. A completely Alan different Anson. player. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll now. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Number five, your 700th appearance for Liverpool, August 2012, oh God. in a European away game. Who were the opponents? I don't know. It was Brendan Rodgers' first game. You won't get that one. I don't think no. it's a really tough one. Give it, is it like a double battle one or no? no? One one word. What what country were they from? I think it was was it Slovenia yeah. or, or Lithuania? One of the two. It was Lubjic or something. Lubjic. No. Gommel. Who? Gommel. Oh no. <laughs> no. And six. Finally, Mo Salah 
sits in fifth place in Liverpool's all-time scoring list on 186, mm. which iconic name from the club's past is next on the list that he's trying to reel in? Who's, who's so in he's, 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 he's fifth. He's fifth at the minute. Yeah. Who's fourth on 228? Well, it, it can't be right because he's already been one of the answers. Is it Gordon Hodgson? No. No, he's, I think he's a bit higher. Yeah. Uh, going he's, back he's gone past way. Stevie, hasn't he? Roger yeah. Runs. Aldo? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, there, he's older than me. I'll give you the yeah. So you've obviously... So well Mo Salah's way. He's, he's fifth. He's fifth. So obviously Ian Rush, Gordon Hodgson, Roger Hunt must yeah. be there. So yeah. there's another yeah. one. Yeah. You've done well there. Is it Billy Little? It is. Hey! 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 <laughs> Five out of six. Okay. Signing off on a high. Five yeah. out of six. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. It's a, it's a good one to finish on, that. Good quiz. Yeah. Uh, good thanks, Kara. Okay, brilliant, mate. Thanks Our for having me on. One, Thank great, you. We're really thanks delighted you, that you could come Thank and you, make Thank it. Thank you. Um, anyway, this is the Aldo podcast with Peter, the German. <laughs> My German, mate. <laughs> James Peace and the number one. Jamie Cargill, we'll see you soon in the future.